You are listening to Making It in the Toy Industry, episode number 200. Welcome to Making It in the Toy Industry, a podcast for inventors and entrepreneurs like you. And now your host, Ajel Wade. Hey there, toy people, Ajel Wade here, and welcome back to another episode of the Toy Coach Podcast, Making It in the Toy Industry. This is a weekly podcast brought to you by thetoycoach.com. Our guest today is actually going to flip the script on our normal podcast format, and she's going to be interviewing me. Virginia Lett is a highly experienced Australian media presenter who's worked in radio and television for three decades. And in addition to hosting Eclipse Music TV on the Seven Network for three years, Virginia was known for presenting news, sports and weather bulletins for numerous major TV networks in every Australian East Coast market. And she just so happens to be a fan of this podcast. After already having a huge career, Virginia actually recently decided to enroll in Toy Creators Academy after listening to this podcast. Virginia is hoping to bring a long-held Toy Creators dream to life over the next 12 months and beyond as she develops her product. And she's thrilled to have an opportunity to interview me on the show. Welcome to the show, Virginia. Thank you so much for being here. Gosh, this is a dream come true for me. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, stop. And you and Virginia also came. For those of you listening to the show, you need to check out the YouTube video. Hopefully it's up by the time you're listening. And you can see in Virginia's background, she has a 200 sign just for the show. It's like gold. There's lights around it. I mean... (laughs) Thank you. I just moved into a new home. I have, I don't even have a backdop anymore, but Virginia (laughs) brought the glitz. So thank you. (laughs) Well, you deserve it. 200 episodes is a huge achievement. I mean, that's something to celebrate. So congratulations. Thank you. I know it's, it's too much, but (laughs) thank you. Thank you. You were telling me before we got started that you also had a podcast and that today would be your 500th episode. That's right. Yes. Wow. I was doing for the last two years a, a news podcast for little kids. Our target demo was four to six years old. Okay. And it was just a five or six minute podcast every day where we'd dip a toe into the world of news and learn about things around the world. And it was a lot of fun. Yeah. But we, we, we finished up mid year. Still there, though, if you want to have a listen. <laughs> What's it called? <laughs> it's called Morning Kids. Morning Kids. Okay. We, yeah. I'll link it in the show notes. <laughs> sure do. Awesome. It's fun. You can listen back to it retrospectively too. There's a lot of chat about animals and colors and feelings and all those sorts of things. It was a, it was a real treat to do it. Well, thank you for jumping back into your career in media for me, right? <laughs> because you've been staying at home with your little one recently. Well, she's a big one now. She was a little one. <laughs> yes. That's right. This is is a huge treat for me. It really is. I, I, in my um, line of work, I've had the opportunity to interview some wildly famous people, and very rarely did I ever get nervous. But I'm, I feel like I'm a little bit starstruck interviewing. Oh my gosh! Stop it! For real, you need to stop. (laughs) No, seriously. I mean, we listen to you every week on your podcast, and we follow you on your social media channels. (laughs) Some of us, the lucky ones, have even interacted with you through the Toy Creators Academy. And we're constantly fed glimpses of you and the world that you live in, in the same way that we're fed glimpses into the lifestyle of famous celebrities and things like that. So, you know, I'm sure there are others, myself included, that feel like we could strike up a conversation with you on the street or invite you over for family dinner on a Sunday night. Yes. (laughs) And yet you don't even know most of our names or where we come from or why we're here or what we look like. So that must be wild to you. Yeah. When when I first started, it was weird. I didn't expect it at first and I didn't know how to handle it. But now I think it's cool. But at first I was like, what's going on? <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> what's yeah. happening? It's fame. I mean, I find myself <laughs> it's fame. in this year. It's fame, you know, people will recognize you because you're just so recognizable and beautiful with your gorgeous oh, hair and, you. and everything Amazon. like that. And, you know, I find myself, <laughs> I can't look it up. <laughs> I find myself thinking, oh, I wonder how Agel and Christian enjoyed their holiday to Mexico. Oh, or, you know, I wonder what prompted the move with the house or, oh. you know, when does she possibly fit in her salsa dancing glasses. Listening to your podcast always leaves me with this insatiable thirst for more. The questions I have, it's crazy. 
So today is why I'm so excited to be able to flip that script for your 200th episode. Today, a listener, a longtime admirer of yours gets to grab the mic and interview you. This is the greatest Christmas gift I could ever hope for. So thank you. (laughs) You are making my week right now. Thank you. Seriously, a heart to heart with the accomplished, incredibly talented and influential world toy guru, as you'll wait. <laughs> Ladies oh and gentlemen, a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm bowing. Thank you. All right. Well, can I start? Yes, please. Let's dive know, in. Kind of a weird, isn't it? It's a Let's weird it. scenario here for you. All right. A very legitimate question to start. When do you sleep? <laughs> because I wake up. And you're doing stuff and you've done all the stuff while I was sleeping and I tune in and you've posted stuff and you're always available. I mean, how many hours do you get of sleep a night? (laughs) I do. I get a reason. Okay. Actually the last two nights I haven't been sleeping well, so they don't count, but especially since I've moved to this new house and I'm out in, in New Jersey now. I sleep a lot more. So we'll go to bed around like 11, 12 and wake up around seven, but like, depending if I have something to do or if I don't, I might get out of bed at eight, but yeah, it's not that serious. I think, right. (laughs) I've I've actually taken on one of your mannerisms from listening to so many of your podcasts. Which one? I find myself a lot saying, oof. (laughs) (laughs) When you you go to bed at midnight, I'm like, oof, oof. oof. (laughs) That was one that came through. I thought you were going to say 100%. So <laughs> that too, 100%. 100%. 100%. Uh, all right. So you, you're looking after yourself though. You get you are getting some sleep. Yeah, I do. I get sleep. And especially here, it's so quiet. I used to live in the city and this is like amazing how quiet it is. Now I get sleep. I think I have the right tools. I have a lot of tools that repurpose things and repost things. And people often think that their followers are seeing everything they post. And that's just not true. So you just Mm -hmm. repost things that didn't get a lot of likes and see if it'll get likes later, you know? Definitely. All right. Another legitimate question. (laughs) We're sort of like, it's very superficial, but it's important. How tall are you? Because when I imagine you in real life, I'm like, is she my height? She looks oh. really petite. I got to know to help with the visualization. <laughs> I'm super tiny. I'm 5'3 after yoga. So <laughs> let me ca- let me explain that answer. So my license says I'm 5'3. Here's why. But okay, up until my license said I was 5'3 in the past, like, I don't know, seven years, I was 5'2. So here's what happened. I got the job at Toys R Us. And one day while I'm at my dream job, they're like, there's a company here that's going to do a health assessment of everybody for free as part of our health insurance plan. They're going to, I know for you, you're in Australia, what you probably have healthcare. We don't have that here. So for us, we were like, oh my gosh, a free health screening. Yes. So we lined up and I go, they check my weight, they check everything, they check my height and they say you're five, three. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm five, two. And they check, double check. They said, I'm five, three. And they said, do you do yoga? And I said, yes. And they were like, well, Sometimes that happens. And I said, well, I'm 5'3". So I'm tiny, but I'm 5'3". <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful size to be. See, lots of very famous pop stars and divas. They're all They're your tiny. height. So it makes sense. I'm small. <laughs> Just on that yoga thing. I often find myself wondering what people think about when they're doing yoga, because to give you an example, when I'm doing yoga, all I'm thinking about is how badly I need a pedicure. Really? Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I'm looking no. at my feet. <laughs> I'm trying about? really hard to not think about work. So mm. I'm literally thinking about breathing. I had this one amazing yoga teacher who would give you such visualization once. And he he just helped me get out of my head so much. And it was around the time I was dealing with the cancer. And he would just like... His thing was imagine a ball of light and we would imagine it, I think, starting at our feet or something and rolling up to our chest and then like coming out to our arms. And that really helped me focus on what I think you're supposed to be focusing on in yoga and just like nothing. You're breathing and you're being. So sometimes I try to do that. I like that. I like that a lot. You touched on your cancer thing, and I'd like to come back to that shortly. And of course, I do have some really proper business style toy yeah. coach legitimate questions a little later on as well. Okay, okay. But before we get there, I went back to your 100th episode 
which was published two years ago in November 2021, where the topic was really similar to what we're doing today. I think it was titled Getting to Know the Toy Coach. Yep. I learned a lot about you there. And it started with an amazing audio montage of all of your students and what they've achieved and what they've learned from you, which in itself is the most incredible portfolio of your work, right? Oh, thank you. And in that podcast, I feel like we should touch back on it because some people wouldn't have listened to it. We'll we'll run through it quickly, but your mom ran a model and talent agency and you were a child actress on Sesame Street, no less. (laughs) This is why I've got stars in my eyes. Your mom's entrepreneurial influence inspired you to start up a bunch of kitty businesses, including selling photos and jewelry and stationery. Your business prowess goes way back, lady friend. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're allergic to cats and dogs is something else I learned. <laughs> oh, Your yes. favorite food is anything potato. Oh, my gosh. And mac and cheese. Is, I can't believe I said like that. All fruit? <laughs> I love still? potatoes. Yeah. Is it too? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> love potatoes. And you took up salsa dancing about 10 years ago after a car accident. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Okay. We're getting deep here. You shared some of the lessons that you learned when you started your first real business and but that was costumize me. And I know that you've actually done multiple podcast episodes on the lessons that you've learned. So yes. they're going back to, and then you mentioned that you were diagnosed with cancer when you were in your late twenties, you're mm-hmm. working at Toys R Us. Mm-hmm. And like anybody with a shock diagnosis like that, you thought that your life was over. Oh, um, for sure. We are. So I'd love to get an update on that if there is one. Yeah, I don't have much of an update. I do go back by annually. Uh, that can mean two things. But I go back every two years. That's what that also can mean, right? Yeah. So I go back every two years and I've been clear. I'm good so far. So pray to God, knock on wood, whatever you believe that I stay okay. So that's my only update. I was really lucky. It was just a, a simple surgery and a month of recovery. And I had a great job that really supported that. And I was good to go. With a lot of fear, but I was good to go. Well, we're all very happy to hear that for sure. Thank you. There was a whole bunch of other super interesting stuff and important things that I won't go back over in detail, but I mean, anybody that wants to, they can go back and listen to episode number 100, right? But you express some of your life goals and what what inspires you and what helps you to grow your business, your value system, and what made you start up the podcast which I think is probably the most thing to rehash at this point in time now that you've hit 200. Mm. I'm just curious to know, for those that haven't listened back to your podcasts previously, it was a question that someone posed to you, a friend that was looking to start up a toy business. It got you thinking, hey, I can help people with this information, right? Yeah, it was, well, it was someone I had just met at a toy industry event And she was so passionate about this game idea. And then she didn't know what she needed to give me so that I could potentially pitch it to my boss at the time. And I wanted to help her, but I was so busy. I was VP of brand and product. I was super busy and I couldn't really help her. And then I remember thinking while I was at work, I wish there was just a blog that I could point her to or a podcast I could point her to just something to tell her this is what we need. So time goes on. I was still doing Costumize Me kind of in the background of my full-time job. So I would listen to a lot of business podcasts about how to make Costumize Me grow. So I was listening to those podcasts and eventually realized that I should maybe be doing a business with all the stuff I already know about the toy industry instead of trying to do something so separate from what I already spent all my time doing. That was when I got the idea for the podcast. And I thought it would be easier to do a podcast than a blog, which I was totally wrong. Way, way harder, I think, in my opinion. And yeah, I asked my boss, I said, is it okay if I do this podcast? Because it is about the toy industry. He said, yeah, just don't release any of our secrets. And I was like, don't worry. It's going to be all about how I see the toy industry and what I think people should do. And don't you worry. So that's what I did. Did you find that when you were coming up with content for the podcast, that there were any conflicts of interest? Was it difficult to navigate it? in that way? No. And I think that was because I came in and brought so much to the most recent company that I I was with. Like I really came in and built out their system for product development. So that was all stuff I brought with me. 
And also because I started the podcast so 101, I was teaching things that I'd learned like through school and through my first job. It really wasn't hard because it was so 101. So it was like, here's how you find a factory. <laughs> like, here's how you talk to them. Very, yeah. very simple. 101 to you. I'm yeah, like, exactly. I'm For me, it was 101. That. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it was 101. A question that somebody posed in the 100th episode to you was about imposter syndrome and yeah. whether or not you've felt it and how you've dealt with that. I feel like a lot of people that are doing your course and maybe listening to the podcast also feel imposter syndrome from time to time. You know, a lot of them looking to break out of their old careers or moving into an industry that they feel like they have no idea about whatsoever. Yeah. And that can be incredibly unsettling. How did you find that? I honestly, I didn't deal with imposter syndrome until I felt like people were coming at me. Until I became so public that people had opinions, that was when I started dealing with it. Before that, I just so much believed in what I wanted to do that it didn't ever even occur to me to be an imposter because it was just so simple what I was doing and also free. You know, when you're doing something that's free, it's easy to feel like, well, who cares? Because I'm doing it for free. And once you start putting a price on things, that's when you start to feel like, oh, <laughs> you know, am I really worth this price? Is my product really worth this price? Is my service really worth this price? And then when you start saying things that go against the grain and people start coming at you, that's when you're like, is it worth it? For, did like, did I just shut down, you know, I thought, did I just shut down, you know, five or 10 years of career opportunities when I came out with an episode called The Ripple Effect of Racial Bias? And I don't know, I feel like the good and bad of this digital age that we're in is that you can shut it off. You feel, for me, I feel the insecurity when I'm reading, you know, certain comments or if I'm reading a certain email, just dealing with those issues digitally but when I shut it down and I turn it off, that is where I can come back to peace and talk to my husband and my sister and my mom and tell them all about my insecurities and then ignore them when they say you're the best thing ever. And then <laughs> that's my that's how I work through it. And then ideally, honestly, I get a win from a student or a client or for myself that reaffirms, okay, you are doing something that is needed and worthwhile and you are, are should be paid for it. And the amount you are asking for isn't too much. And honestly, if it is, they don't have to pay you. You know, if somebody decided to work with you, they value you and you should let them. So I don't know, you just can't give up, I guess. That's the way you deal with it. You just can't give up. And I try to remind myself when I'm feeling insecure or when I'm feeling having like a panic attack, like I can't go on this show when I'm so nervous or whatever, I just try to remind myself like this is going to pass. So it can either pass with you doing a great job at this show or it can pass with you like falling apart and not doing it at all. So it's going to pass. Tomorrow is coming. Just like, how do you want to get there? Yeah. Even back then you talked about how technically the definition of imposter is fraud. And right. What, you're not intentionally deceiving people, right? Yeah. You're, you're the real deal and you're armed with the information that people want. You really are. Like people come to you because you are the most equipped person to help them develop their idea. And we're all very grateful for that. I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody who's listening to this podcast that you are the real deal. And Aww. people who are moving into the industry, your students, they're also the real deal. They shouldn't feel that imposter syndrome. They're giving it a go. Yeah. And also the real deal is somebody who not only has the capability to execute something, but executes it. Beyonce is a great performer and a great singer, but there are plenty of great performers and great singers who are not as big as Beyonce. It doesn't mean that she's not the real deal because they're as good as or better than her. But it's like you have to go for it and offer yourself and give the service or give the product and make it readily available. And then you too can be the real deal. I think, I don't know, I get nervous when people say like, you are the real deal because it's like, there are other people out there that know plenty more than me. I have them on my podcast. They enrich my students' lives and my life all the time. But if you want somebody who's going to be with you through the process and you want to have education that's laid out for you to get from point 
idea to point like on the shelf or license. I have intentionally built a business to get you there. No one has intentionally built a whole business around getting you there. And that is what you get with me. Correct. Yeah. I feel like I'd struck gold when I came across your podcast. Ah. (laughs) And like to use a similar analogy, it's like people that go to an art gallery and stand there and, you know, look at a piece of art and go, oh, well, I could do that. Right. I could do that better. Yeah. And then, you know, I think I might've even said that once to my husband, I could do that. looks like a kindergarten student did it. And he's like, yeah, "Yeah, you're not. (laughs) And you did it. Right. You're not not doing it. So. (laughs) Exactly. There you go. Because there's so much more to it. I mean, like having the information is step one, knowing how to package it so other people can understand it is a teacher's heart. Knowing how to market it is a marketer's heart. Like there's just, it's a, the real deal, I guess, encompasses all of that, right? Definitely yeah. does. Moving on to some new questions. Now, I've listened to a lot of your podcast episodes. Yes. You have an entire library of them, 200 in fact now. And I think for a lot of people who are just finding you or who will find you in the future, potentially you might not like to hear this, but they're probably only going to go back and listen to the ones that pique their interest, judging yeah. by the title, right? Because it's going to be a lot to have to go back and listen to 200 episodes. So I've compiled a bunch of questions for getting to know the toy coach part two. (laughs) And I hope that you and your listeners will forgive me if you've actually answered any of these before. They're all new to me. And as we said earlier, there's no harm in revisiting them because as somebody very wise once said, may have even been you, create once and publish often. And that's something I've got up on my wall now too, because the content that you're producing is amazing and it's Mm -hmm. okay to keep rehashing it for the new people that are coming in or just to refresh people's memories, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the first questions I've got for you is that I'd love to know, what is your most listened to episode? Do you know, do you have information? I do. It's it's the first episode, which I guess just because when people find it, they go to the first episode, but it's called Unlocking Your Great Toy Ideas. It's a great mm-hmm. title too. <laughs> Hats off to me. Yeah. But for anybody 100%. that does discover this podcast later, I actually have thought about this. So I have the toycoach.com slash playlist is like a PDF that highlights a PDF and a playlist of my top 10 episodes, kind of in order of not top 10, the top 10 episodes that you would need to listen to, to develop an idea. So kind of in order, it's like a good starter pack. Like it's your starter pack of episodes. That's perfect because that was actually going to be my next question. Like oh. would you put together your top 10 most valuable episodes to listen to? So where would people find that list? It's the toycoach.com slash playlist. And I do plan to make three different playlists. Cause I know, you know, from being in my course in module three, we talk about the different paths in the toy industry. So that playlist is really for inventors and entrepreneurs, but I feel like we could do a separate, cause there's so many episodes now we could do a separate playlist for the entrepreneurs, the inventors, we could do a playlist for the executives. So that's coming. Right. I'm going to be going back and listening to all okay. of those for sure. Yeah. I do. I find myself the same, like going back through and listening to the ones that I've favorited. Yeah. Quite and I always yeah. get something new out of them. Oh, so it's I, incredibly valuable. Even when I go to edit episodes, I'm especially like interview episodes, not the ones that I write. I mean, I write them and practice them for so long. So like I know the information there, but <laughs> the episodes that I interview people when I'm editing them, I learn things again. I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, that was a good point. Like, yeah, they were. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. And well, part of the beauty of the episodes that I listen back to is that they seem so timeless as well. Yeah, you know, They're not aging terribly, which is very helpful for people that want to come in and listen back to them retrospectively from two years ago. So, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a huge credit to you. Thank you. Yeah. I try to make to, even if I'm telling you information about right now, I'm also telling you how we got there. So you can try to get there yourself later. Like if you listen to it later. I'm wondering on a more personal note, can you recount your first ever pinch me moment in your career where you were like, whoa, I cannot believe I'm here. Yeah, I can. And it was probably Access Daily when like Mario <laughs> Lopez was like looking and I mean, it was virtual, so it wasn't. I watched virtual. it. I watched but, it back on, yeah. on YouTube. Yeah, it was. So yeah. that was probably it when he was like looking at me in a virtual setting, whatever, but his dimples were so deep. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, this is me, my moment. 
Yeah, that was great. <laughs> That's very cool. Very, very cool. This might be a bit left field, but what do you think could be a common misperception about you and how would you write that? Ooh, As, yeah. What's your, what's your truth behind that common misperception? I think that I, I don't know. I want to say that I'm young, but that's, I mean, I don't know. You're young. I'm not that young. Like people think I'm like 20. I'm not that <laughs> young. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. What is it? I don't think people would tell me. I think, okay, like a positive or negative one. <laughs> let's no, clar- let's clarify. Sure. Whatever you're willing to share. I mean, <laughs> okay. So cool like out. a common misconception is that like, I'm always happy because I'm not. Mm-hmm. And I think people are off put when they meet me in person. If I'm not in a super like bubbly mentality, especially if they meet me when I'm in the middle of working like a booth or something. I'm definitely a lot more, I think, short than people expect. So I try really hard to stay present and Mm -hmm. figure out language that even when delivered in a short tone of voice communicates that I care. I'm just occupied. I guess that was in a, is that in a negative way? That's in a positive, no, no, that's like a positive I, perception. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier about people feeling like they know you. Yeah. You know, I guess to some extent you have to be high energy when you're doing your podcasts and your interviews. Yes. You have to yeah. be on your game. You have to bring out your A game every week for that. Yeah. And potentially we don't know that you, that could be the only time that you're really flying high, you know, it's it, to some extent it's a character. It's a face that you're having to put on. For that. Mm-hmm. It's so funny because when we started this recording, as soon as I started the podcast part, I realized like, oh, my voice is different. Did she notice that? <laughs> so <it's laughs> like, I was like, oh, because we were just talking regularly. And then all of a sudden I started re- like doing the thing. And then I was like, oh, did she? <laughs> I was like, oh, I just, well, yeah. I just, Right. As someone who's been in that industry for a very long time. I would yeah. normally pick up on that, but I didn't with you. Oh, I get to that a lot too. Romy, my daughter Romy, she'll say, Oh, mom, you've got your you've got your radio voice on. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. You sound like that in real life. I'm like, yes, I do. I yes. Do I, I change? Do I change? My oh. husband says the same thing. I'll be, I'll say something to him and he'll be like, Why are you using your podcast voice? And I'm like, I'm not using it's my regular voice. It just <laughs> I don't know. So funny. So <laughs> yeah. funny. I didn't notice it. Oh, I love funny. it. Yeah. It really perks me up. Thank you. You've had so many achievements. Is there mm. one that you're most proud of at this point in time? Oh, I don't know. Oh my God. I just did the thing. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> Oof. Uh, w- most proud of? Yeah. I don't know. I'm a Virgo. I'm not proud of anything. Oh, <laughs> my best friend too. I think I'm most proud of. Surely I, the court would have to well, be up there. I mean, yeah, I'd be more proud if I could figure out a sponsorship, like an ongoing sponsorship situation for the course. But um, you know what? Maybe it is the podcast because it has created community like kind of effortlessly. It has helped people that can't afford my services, start businesses. It's connected people with the people from my podcast. So as proud as I am of it, it does not pay my bills, but it is a lovely thing that I'm glad that people appreciate because I didn't think that it was going to make such a big impact, but it did. Enormously. I I point so many of my friends in the direction of your podcast, the friends who have no interest in toy creation whatsoever. Yeah. But I, you know, I say to them, this isn't just about creating toys and designing toys. You are going to learn so much about starting a business. Oh, you know, there's so much to learn about whatever industry you're wanting to start a business in. Oh my gosh. There's so much value to be had out of all of your episodes and the people that you've interviewed, branding, design, dealing with factories and just people in general. 
Yeah, I know. I have some people that used to listen to me in the very beginning who were like, oh, I want more episodes about the toy industry. And I want to do more episodes like specifically just this is how you build a toy. But every week something happens and I'm like, oh, I have to talk about this. And then like I get an idea and I'm like, I have to talk about this and we have to get ready for Black Friday and we have to go to this toy trade show. And it's like, I know you want to hear how do you talk to a factory, but it feels redundant when I know I have so many episodes already about that. And this month we need to be going to Shy Tech. <laughs> like, you know, so we need to be talking about that. But I like it. I'm really proud of my podcast. Yes. Yeah. Well, you should be. Thank you. Um, do you get to a point where you're like, oh God, what am I like? What content am I going to put in? Like how many, how many more episodes of this podcast can we do? Or are oh, you just no. so much there? Yes. That we're, uh, you're going to get to 500. <laughs> there is. So it's more about editing because I have the idea list in, I have, it's not Trello, it's ClickUp. We use ClickUp for project management. I have an idea board that I don't even know, probably hundreds of concepts long. I have other ideas that I've started, like scripts I've started. I've have people I've invited that are trying to book interviews, but we're booked out. I don't see there ever really being a time where I'm like, I don't have anything to talk about. And it's not even just talk because I don't want people to think, I think there is a misconception that Ajil talks a lot. She just talks. I'm never going to run out of things to teach. There's so much to learn about creating a playful business, creating a business in the toy industry, dealing with relationships, getting a job in the toy industry. I am not at a loss for ideas. I just need help editing. <laughs> so. <Sure. laughs> that brings me to my next question then. Do you have any expansion plans for the Toy Creators Academy, a new course, or longer term, do you think you might do something like traveling the globe as a keynote speaker or something to that effect? Ooh, I have so many ideas for Toy Creators Academy, but it's a scale issue at this point. So throughout the three years I've done TCA, I have introduced various different things. I had several memberships, one which you know, because you found it, the Toy Creators Club, I think it was called. I had different memberships. I had the virtual pitch event, which is still a thing. There are a couple of other projects, oh, like toy challenges I used to run. There were things that I was trying that didn't really stick. What I've learned in the two years that I was testing all these different things is I really need to focus on what works. And I know what works is Toy Creators Academy and the TCA virtual pitch event. And even the the in-person event kind of works. We need to tweak some things there, but that works as well. So I'm trying to focus on doing those things, getting enough people into those things so that it can be reinvested into something else. I'm not really at a point where... TCA is so overfilled that I'm like, okay, let's do the next thing. I'm just trying to make the pitch events the best, the program the best, and get people licensed and in stores. And that's my focus mostly. And then the side of that is client projects on the side of that. And then I have visions for where the podcast could go. And I have ideas for kind of how I can help people brand themselves in the toy industry because I'm quite good at branding. So it's more like we have to see. It really depends on demand. It depends on the demand, how the demand goes. Because if there's not a ton of demand for TCA, then I have to give what people really want. So we got to sure. see. What about then, do you have any sort of firm career milestones that you'd like to hit in the short and medium mm. term or long term? I always wanted to be the CEO of a toy company before I started my own business. That was always my dream. And then now when I started my own business, I started to realize like, I don't know why that was my dream. Well, I do know why financial stability, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't really know that that aligns with what I want anymore. In doing my own business, I found a new way to live, a new lifestyle. It may not be as lifestyles of the rich and famous, but I get to live in like truth and honesty and I get to just be myself and I get to study toys like it's a very serious thing. Like people hop on calls with me and they seriously want me to break down the 12 and under market for plush. Like they want a serious conversation about that. So it's my job, you know, <laughs> to seriously be invested in, in this call. And I love that. You don't get that kind of freedom when you get to those higher levels. I'm in toy company. So it's just not my goal for right now. And it's not my goal like in the next, I don't know, like two years. I can't think much further than that. 
things keep evolving, don't they? Like yeah. one of the things that you taught me in the course is just to get in and just do it. Like in yes. my head, my toy idea that I have that I'm still wanting to bring to fruition. Yes. I want it to be perfect the first time. And that's yes. not working very well for me. It doesn't me. work. No, no, no. <laughs> so, and, you know, I feel like I have to sacrifice a lot to just get something out there and then I can keep changing it up and making it better. And as you just said, in your whole career, sometimes life's like that too. You set out yeah. to do something. And then once you're on that path, you realize that that like, thing what am that I thought you wanted is yeah. they're not really the end goal anymore. And it was also, I don't want to say it was easy to get because I never got to CEO, but I did get to VP. And at that point it was like, well, how much further do I really have to go? So maybe I don't want to do that right now because that'll be, then I'll finish too fast. I'll be done. I'll be 35. Like, no, I need to like do something else. <laughs> Aren't you the CEO? Aren't you the CEO of this yeah, amazing I mean, brand that you've created? It's so different though. And I've been told this too, like, you know, being the CEO of my company, we don't need to talk revenue, but my company versus like a multi-million or billion dollar toy company, totally different conversations. You don't do the day-to-day -day stuff that I'm doing in my company. You talk big picture, you spend big money putting together big teams to do big things. Sure. And I am stretching small money to put together smaller teams to do big things. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. Like, I think a, different... most, a lot of us have been there. And yeah. Relate. Yeah. It's a different but vibe. You are, you are young. You say that. I'm not you, that young. You are. You really are young. You haven't hit 40 yet. I know oh that. Oh my you. gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 35. That's young. That's well, young. I mean, this is a Zoom filter. So <laughs> it is. I need to know what that is. Does it come with the hair? <laughs> no, it's a Zoom filters in your settings. He's going to turn that up a little bit. <laughs> All right, nice. I'll have a play around with that later. Yeah. <laughs> Back to business for a little bit. I'm curious to know, and maybe some of your listeners are too, what do you see is one of the biggest areas of growth in the toy industry? Do you think it's around Ooh. sustainability or no. no? No, just because we're not equipped to really recycle materials as a country, not the industry. We're not really equipped to make the most of recyclable materials and even to recycle materials. So I actually think sustainability is a challenge for most startup toy companies. One day it will be a great opportunity, but I think until it becomes the norm in manufacturing, it's actually a hump that a smaller company has to get over to be able to afford to provide sustainability. However, Walmart did have an initiative to have their vendor partner switch to sustainable packaging. I think the year was 2025 was their target year. So there is a need to do it in certain ways, like whether it's your packaging or your product. But it's hard for startups because you don't have the numbers when you're just starting yeah. the MOQ, the minimum order quantity numbers. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating, particularly if you like probably a lot of us set out and want to do something good for the, the planet. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know it's yeah. obviously something that your customers would also look on right. quite favorably. But yeah, tough. Well, I would say like if you're starting out and you want to do something sustainable and then you find out that sustainable material is not an option, you should look at things. There are recycling programs that you can affiliate your company with and include information about on your packaging so that you can encourage recycling of your products or mm -hmm. even look at having some sort of a program where every purchase, a certain amount of money goes to recycling and developing plants or things. So I would just look at how you can financially support the initiative if you can't actually make your product out of recycled goods. Nice. Gosh, I'm looking ahead. I've got like lists and lists of questions here, but I'm yeah, conscious, of, conscious of the fact that we're really going long here. Are we? <laughs> so I'm going to narrow it down to three. Let me three. just make sure oh, my oh. husband's not on his way. Okay. Yeah, no, we're good. Okay, go. <laughs> right. I have to pick Let's, him up. <laughs> okay. What is something that really frustrates you about the industry? Uh, I mean, can you just narrow it down to one here for the purposes of the podcast or just that they're so stuck on increasing revenue and growth, but that's every industry in America, but so stuck on growth and revenue year after year over innovation, sometimes over diversity. Sometimes they want to innovate, but the real reason people want to innovate is so they can 
be the better company and make more revenue. And then people just want to stay safe. They're like, want to stay with the price points, the footprints, the product types that work. So that growth is just, I think, a hindrance when they're like, well, how much are we going to grow next year? What's the profit the next year? What is the margin on this? I remember when I first started one company, I won't say who, they had this huge COGS exercise and everybody had to review all of their products and recost all of their products to reduce the COGS cost of goods of the products to help the company have more profit. And so it just becomes like cheaper paper, cheaper plastic. How can we pull out this, pull out that? And it's just, I don't know, it's gross. <laughs> it's really what yeah. it is. I'm going to squeeze in a little side question here yeah. too then. Sometimes I think that while so many new products that are coming out to market and so forth are really quite innovative, it mm-hmm. also feels like sometimes that they're not all that innovative. They're, they're just rehashed from old things. You yeah. Know? Where are the opportunities to be innovative? Do you think that the broader toy market is willing and open to really like left field innovative product? Is there room for that? I mean, yeah, there is. But I think the problem is bigger than the toy industry. The problem is capitalism (laughs) because designers would love to make this cool, new, innovative thing. And marketers would probably love to promote that thing. But at the end of the day, somebody's come in with a projection spreadsheet. Somebody's coming in and saying, this is what sold last year. And then a buyer is looking at what worked last year and then looking at what you're presenting them this year and is saying, "Um, I don't think so. You know, everybody's, it's just this revenue. We've gotten ourselves on this revenue hamster wheel as a country. I mean, I don't know if it's like this in Australia. So there's just this chase to do better than last year, better than last year. And that stifles creativity, like social media stifles creativity from content creators and artists. It's just the need to keep producing. I found your episodes around AI really, really eye-opening. And I went into mid-Jenny and Discord and all those sorts of things after you're listening to your episodes and had a bit of a play around. Do you think maybe that there's an avenue there for innovation and seeing what will work? Yeah. What I wonder, what I think will happen, and I I wonder if it's going to happen more, is companies will use AI to generate concepts and then test those renderings to their audiences that they've built up and see how the audience responds before developing the product. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it'll work because like, we don't know who owns what AI creates because it's parsing information from all across, across the web, unless you use a tool like maybe Adobe Firefly seems to be changing that a little bit. But yeah, I think that's going to be an innovative way to see, is our consumer base interested in it? Just get them to vote on a photo, you know? (laughs) Like, Yeah. yeah. It's mind boggling really, isn't it? All right. Second last question. Okay. (laughs) Which one am I going to go for here? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. What's something that's happened to you that you wouldn't otherwise share on your podcast? Oh, oh my God. I don't know. (laughs) This is me. It's one of the questions I'm like, I've got to interview that That's girl sometime. That's happened to me that I, I would find not. find out more about her. That I would not share so many things. I am not. A, I mean, <laughs> I'm a personal brand, but like, if you've noticed, like, it's not that personal. <laughs> like, got it, got it. But, um, mm, okay. Let me think of something. Maybe something that happened to you in the last few weeks that you oh, wouldn't few weeks. really think to, to share with your listeners. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I know. Huh? No, no, I got I got one. So I totally believe in ghosts. <laughs> and a hundred percent. And totally up until like this morning, thought my house was haunted, my new house. I was like, oh yeah, we definitely have a ghost. A hundred percent. Here's why. And the reason is embarrassing. So I went to the store and I bought some tights because it's winter. Got to stay warm. So I bought some tights and I brought these tights upstairs and they were still in the package. And I was like, I'm going to just put them in my socks drawer. And I put them in there. And then my husband comes to bed and I'm like, hmm, my socks drawer. I'm pretty sure I closed that, but it's open. Can you close it? So that was like strike number one for there's a ghost. And then, <laughs> and then he closed it, but I didn't say anything. 
And then the next day I went to get my socks and one of them was missing or my stockings. And then I was like, honey, I think we have a ghost. (laughs) The more we talked about it, the more he was like, they have to be here somewhere. And I'm like, no, I remember taking them upstairs and I put them in the drawer and, and one of them is missing. And he's like, why would a ghost take your stockings? And I was like, I don't know. Maybe they're just like a little poltergeist ghost and they just want to like have a good time. And then I was like, wait a second. That drawer is overfilled. Perhaps it just fell down to the next drawer and it did. (laughs) So I I open up the next drawer and I'm like, oh, they're right here. (laughs) I don't have a ghost. Yeah, but see, maybe another ghost put it back. (laughs) That's also what it's like having kids, by the way. I think it must be a lot of ghosts in my place too, because there's always stuff going missing. (laughs) That's it. I was like, I don't. I put it there. Did you? Did you really? <laughs> oh, my All right. Let's, let's wrap up with um, another quite random question, but one very relevant to your 200th podcast episode oh, yeah. today. Yes. And I think we need to know what is your 200th episode or birthday wish? Oh. When, when you're blowing out the candles later tonight, yes. sitting there with Christian and you've got a cake and you're blowing out those candles, what wish are you making? Oh my gosh. I wish that every does like wanna be toy or game inventor listening to my podcast joins Toy Creators Academy. <laughs> that is my wish. There's power in numbers. And together, the more of us that we are together, the bigger impact we can make on this industry. And the more retailers and toy companies that I can get to to come and meet with us. Yeah, so I I would love more of my listeners to just come come meet with me for a TCA walkthrough because I offer those meetings. So <laughs> yeah, I I would is that is that a good wish? Is that a bad wish? That's a wonderful but, wish. Oh, okay. And what what can we do to help that? You know, we need to spread the word. Yeah, I mean, leave a review, share an episode. Either of those things are great. The reviews help me deal with my imposter syndrome. (laughs) So so leave a review to put a smile on my face and share the episode to help my dreams come true. Hooray. Yes. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Amazing. And it's, it's Christmas now too. It's all happening at, uh, at once. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm sad. It's It's over. Oh, we could do it again. Was it good? What? You were wonderful. Okay, cool. Absolutely incredible. And we learned so much more about you. And it's just, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to ask you some questions. And if I'd been able to get in touch with a lot of your listeners before this episode, I would have liked to have asked them what questions they'd like to ask you as well. So it's so funny because the episode 100 Somebody had reached out to me and said, we should interview you because I want to know more about your successes, Agile, and what you've done in the industry. And so that 100th episode came about because that person at the time gathered questions for me and those were listener questions. So we did we did both ways. 100 was listener questions. 200 was a professional asking me questions. That's You're a toy really media cool. person now, I think. <laughs> right? In my dreams. Thank you so, so much for this opportunity. Honestly, as I said at the very beginning of the episode, the ultimate gift for me to be able to interview you, Agile. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, Virginia, thank you so much for offering to do this. I've never been interviewed by one of my listeners before. This was really cool. Well, there you have it, Toy People. That is Virginia's interview with me for this week's podcast episode. If you loved what we chatted about on today's podcast episode, you can see more at thetoycoach.com forward slash podcast. If you want to get the links to anything I mentioned in this episode, like Virginia's podcast that she had done a while back, then head over to thetoycoach.com forward slash 200. So weird to say not one. And if you love this podcast and you haven't already left a review, what are you waiting for? Your reviews mean so much to me and it keeps me motivated to keep coming back week after week. As always, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. I know your time is valuable and that there are a ton of podcasts out there. So it means the world to me that you tune into this one. Until next week, I'll see you later, toy people. Thanks for listening to Making It in the Toy Industry podcast with Agile Wade. Head over to thetoycoach.com for more information, tips, and advice. Hey, are you an aspiring toy inventor or toy entrepreneur? 
then you should check out Toy Creators Academy, the first of its kind online program designed to help you develop and pitch your toy ideas. Head over to toycreatorsacademy.com to learn more.